Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life. Well, at uh, 22 hours and 34 minutes into the uh, 21st day of November uh, 2021, uh, we are doing our observation vlog, and we're going to take a little bit of a detour right now because uh, two comments came in, uh, one on Twitter and the other one on uh, on the uh, in the comments of uh, YouTube. <laughs> Some guy, uh, I don't know who the person is. I haven't checked who the person is. I'll talk to him. Uh, it says, hello, SpongeBob, because I have... On my uh, my notes vlog, uh, I have SpongeBob in the background. That's where I sit to do a large chunk of my work. And this kind of connects with the next question that comes on Twitter: is the person who is having a hard, having a hard having a hard time because he's been trying to get into schools for a PhD in uh, oncology, and uh, he's done good work, but he's been he's being rejected. He's not getting into the programs he wants to get into. And so we were having a bit of discussion about how to proceed, because this is what I've done, is I proceeded on my own. There is an enormous amount of risk in that. Uh, my sort of inclination in terms of research is I like exploration. And exploration is going into the unknown, not knowing what you're going to find. But this is daunting for a lot of people. A lot of people find this very difficult to do because they want a sort of a structure. This is what his, his problem is. He keeps asking for a structure. But when you're doing exploration, you're going into something you've really never done before. And other and, and other people have done, there, there are very few people who have done this in terms of setting up their own institute. Then again, you're dealing with something that where there really isn't a sort of a guideline as to how to go about doing this, and there's an enormous amount of risk involved. So I'm helping him. I'm trying to sort of walk him through the process of setting up your own institute, uh, publishing your uh, your your papers, your PhD thesis, your work, to give yourself a presence on the internet, but leave the critique open. You're not doing closed peer review. You're doing an open an open critique rather than a closed critique. Uh, most people, in terms of when they're doing their uh, PhD process will do a closed critique of their PhD thesis. They'll have a group of professors or so on and so forth uh, who they will give their presentation in front of usually their dissertation. And the professors will ask questions and sort of challenge the ideas brought forward in the PhD thesis. In other words, the person who is the PhD candidate will have to defend the ideas he's bringing forward. But the thing is, is, that's a subjective path. If you're going to try and prove something that's objective, and this is what I was doing, is talking about uh, quantum mechanics, particularly from the perspective of the random walk and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, I wanted to see how far this principle would stretch. You know, if physics is the pinnacle... My friends are leaving... If physics is the pinnacle of all sciences, in other words, you can see all sciences within it. Every science, physics means nature, and every science that you can think of has has uh, a nature to it that you can call physics. So you can do biophysics, you can do chemo, uh, uh, chemo physics, you can do organic chemistry, which has which which is macro macromolecular physics. In other words, almost every area you can think of in science has a physics to it. So you can attach it to it. But the thing is, no one has ever done that. Most people sort of stick very, they're very vertical in their understanding of science, that they have one particular view and that's it. Uh, and that's the vertical view. They have uh, only virology, only microbiology, only uh, oncology, or, 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 or only genetic structures. And it, it, they, they're... Their focus is very, very minute in terms of its latitude. But in physics, you, if, particularly if you're doing the random walk, your view has to be very wide. So I wanted to see how far you can go with this, uh, particularly with the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. 
So I added in something that I thought would do this uh, and get me into a lot of other areas, and that is, uh, and this was an area of interest as well. I added into the thesis, I added in uh, cybernetics. Cybernetics is the uh, task of putting together a human model, a, a working human model uh, of the human being uh, with intelligence and the physiology. In other words, you're approaching the mechanical man. This is the android. How would you duplicate what you see in the body? How, how do you understand the process within the human body, including thought, speech, and everything else that goes along with being human? This is where AI, artificial intelligence, comes from. So what happens is you have enough there to go into enough different areas, and this is what include, I realized as I did the work that, okay, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the random walk apply to psychology because you can do observational work. This is where we're talking. This is why we're here doing uh, under the observations law. We're talking about psychology, and we're talking. Uh, oh no, you're doing Paul. No, we're talking about psychology. We're talking about why people do what they do, their behaviors. Now, of course, it comes out within politics. This is where we see it play out. But we see uh, what we see. Sorry, what we see in the media is primarily theater. It's 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 an act. It's 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 a stage. It's political. Uh, well, called political theater. And so what happens is you have to go into it and see, well, wh why are these people acting? And it, when you see an actor there, ask yourself the question, okay, once the person's not acting, what's, what's their behavior like? You know, why did the person choose to go into acting instead of being real? And so these are all different questions that you ask. This is the analysis you can go through by doing observation. As I said, I'm sitting out here doing my work in astrophysics and uh, not astrophysics. Uh, atmospheric physics and uh, uh, acoustical physics. Right now, the, the sky is clear. Uh, you can see and see the planes go by. Earlier, about uh, an hour ago, there was enough cloud cover, and the cloud cover came in. I just saw it on the satellite. Cloud well, cover was upper layers, but it's cold enough that the upper layer clouds dropped. They dropped to a point where you couldn't see the planes. That means we have a path here that's approached to. Uh, Here's an airport, so you can understand where the altitude is. And typically, uh, most of those planes are in, in the lower portion of the atmosphere that's closer to the ground known as the troposphere. They're not higher up in the stratosphere. Uh, so what happens is that you can get a gauge, an understanding of how high the clouds are. In other words, this is a comparative analysis based on your observation. Now, it's not going to give you exact, but the thing is you don't need exact. You need an approximation. Where are the clouds coming from? Are they coming from high to low, or are they, uh, or are they just sort of not there or interspaced? Or you know, right now they're interspaced. There's not a lot of clouds up here. There's, you know, good gaps between them. But this was, but, but an hour ago there was no gaps between the clouds, and it was low enough so you could hear the planes go over, but you couldn't see them. That means the clouds were lower than the air, than, than the flight paths, flight paths. And the thing is that that meant the clouds came from above. Because the satellite showed no clouds on the lower layer, they came from above. They came from the, the second and third layer, and they dropped to the uh, into the lower layer. This is a, 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 a the thermodynamics is basically your warmer layer, which sits on the bottom, particularly during the daytime, will block the upper layers that are colder. However, at night, and this is why I watch it do the observation at night. The warmer layer dissipates; it, it, it disappears, and as the lo the warmer layer disappears, the upper layers, even though they're colder, will sink because you know cold air sinks. So they'll uh, remove the, remove the warm air, which is blocking everything. And now you have the two layers, which are which are colder. They'll sink, and that's what we saw. We saw the rain. We saw we saw, and rain is an indication that a system is cooling. Uh, this is then. This is why you notice after a rain after a rainstorm, it's always cooler than before the rainstorm. Unless, of course, another system comes in that brings in more humidity, more moisture, and you now start the process all over again. You have a high heat there. You have a high humidity, and then there was what people talk about the talk about humidity, and it will not ring out. The water will not ring out until an, enough cold air comes in that the, the these cloud clouds can no longer hold the the. the uh, the moisture and it drains out, and then once again you have a cooling uh, after the rain. 
this is the process we're talking about. But I've been out here, I've been doing this now for more than six years out here like this to get this level of understanding. Of understanding. This is how I know about the waveguides. Waveguides is acoustical physics. I know where the trains are coming from based on the waveguides. So to the left, behind me now, to the left, those are, that's the western waveguide. To the right, over there to my right now, is in front of me, that is the uh, eastern waveguide. And if you hear trains coming from there, typically, uh, you in terms of the engine, you know the train is westbound. But however, there are tricks that occur that sometimes the train stop there and you hear the west the eastbound train you hear the horns on the on the on the eastern wave guide because the train is sitting there and as it starts to go it blasts its horn we're getting ready to go and you start hearing it as it moves along uh so it comes up very loud here and as it moves along the sound of the horn gets softer and softer until it starts crossing the street and it crosses the street you hear a long blast for it cover for, for it to cross the street and it gets to the other side when the train is coming in the opposite direction the bizarre thing is if you're listening carefully enough you can hear the horn from far off and it's got an echo to it why because when the corn when the train is coming from the east section where it's coming in and sounds its horn there's a massive field there's a massive open field there and so what happens the sound carries and now instead of being in a narrow type box which is the wave guy, narrow type box that's the wave guy. that creates a lot of echo and it actually amplifies the sound however when it's when you have a wide open space and you don't have that just like an amphitheater instead of having the narrow sharp stuff you have an echo to it and you can hear it almost like it's like it's far off but you can hear it coming towards you because it's getting louder as it, as it comes toward you the, the sound gets louder and louder this is this is this is an observation but it takes it takes a long time to get this information so any research you do takes an enormous amount of time and as i've been doing this for 30 years now there have been ups there have been downs there's a lot of risk to this there are times when i've almost lost everything i've ever had um there are times when i went hungry because in order to pay for equipment that i wanted or needed because you have to design and develop your own equipment because I'm doing observational work, so a lot of stuff just simply isn't there. So you have to learn tricks and workarounds and so on and so forth. So you do create your own lab. You create your own environment. You create your own sort of uh, library. Uh, but again, this all takes time. Uh, as a, there were times when, I, when in order to get the extra equipment that I needed or wanted, uh, I just simply cut my food budget, so I didn't have enough money for food. Uh, that's what I do now is that in order to put enough equipment money into equipment, I'm spending about uh, $45 a week on food. That's it. My food budget is $45 a week. And so I cut a large chunk of my food out. It's not, it's not, but it's not, not that I'm going hungry. I just found other ways to bring in food cheaper. I buy in bulk. I buy, you know, I, I, I buy things. I found services. That will actually deliver to me free uh, once you buy a certain amount of food. And the way it works, the way it breaks down is I'm spending $45 a week. So I have a lot more money now uh, saved up so that I can spend on equipment. So I'll give it, I did eat out every once in a while. Uh, and let's say now eating out, let's say McDonald's. McDonald's will cost me $25 to deliver it to where I am. Uh, and it lasts for one meal, and that's it. Uh, Mr. Sub, a sub, you order two subs uh, to get it the way you want it, and that costs you $40. And it'll ask you two meals, so you're spending $20 a meal. You're saving $5 off of the McDonald's. Pizza is about $35, but it lasts you for five meals, so you're spending about $7 a meal. Uh, on pizza. Cutting that out, I can buy tablets for that amount. I can buy uh, extra phones that I use as, as cameras for that amount. Uh, I've got mixers, small, tiny little mixers that I'm going to use to, to sort of create a, a cartoon. It allows me to change my voice. So 
so I can do the different voices within the cartoon uh, easier than it would be if I, if I had to do it on my own. And so what happens is you, you, you have this opportunity now to do things that you normally wouldn't have done before. And eventually I'll be using it out here because the, I, I, the, the phones don't do justice to the sound out there. You can't hear the stuff properly. But if I add a mixer in here with a microphone that allows you to bring in the sound, then you're going to hear the sound a lot better. And that's the thing I'm working on now is to improve the sound out here so that you can also do an audio observation as well as the visual that you're doing now and my description of the visual. But I said that it, it's a daunting task. It, it, this is something that is, am I the best scientist around? No. I'd pretty say, I, I, I would say I'm mediocre. So what gets me to the position that I am, I am now? It's simply when everyone else, or when every now, everyone else would have quit by now, I'm still there. Still blur plugging away. And I know that if I don't get it right away within a week to two weeks, that could be a month from now, two months from now, a couple of years from now. I mean, one of the things I'm talking about now in the Nosey's vlog, uh, I've been studying this stuff for years, but I never really had a solid piece of evidence the way I have now. And it's a letter, it's actually an article written by a rabbi, and I'm leaving the rabbi's name out, and I'll be eventually posting uh, the uh, pictures of the, of, of the document. It's amazing. And it shows how, the, how you have the top-down elite system that I talked about before, you talk about the you have the elites, you have the uh, uh, you have the vassal state, and below it you have the people. The vassal state hides what they call the shadow government. It hides it, and it does so because it gives enough incentive to the vassal state that instead of protecting saying they're protecting the higher-ups, the elites. They protect themselves because they don't want to lose what they have. Uh, so in, in the, in the self-interest that these people now have of the vassal state, they're willing to crush other people. This is why I say there's no racism because it's about class. It's about the class, class structure that you're in. The thing is they use racism to create the conflict. And then what this document that I got is from a rabbinical source. And this is, if you want to understand this, the, the best source is a rabbinical source. Judaic history is absolutely amazing. It explains a lot of what's going on today. Without it, you will not understand, and I'm talking about the shadow government, you will not understand a large chunk of what's going on. Socialism is, is not a planned economy. Socialism is, an, is a social engineering concept. This is why they call themselves progressives. The progressive is the Hegelian dialectic. When you have thesis versus antithesis, you need to have a violent clash in order to produce the progress, which is synthesis. Synthesis, synth, synthesis is the result of a violent clash between thesis and antithesis. This is what I found in this document. It sits at the core of Judaica, and the, this core sits across the core of Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. It's also there in the Sunni. In, it's also there in Sunni Islam, and it's the belief that before God, there's God at the top. There's the elect few, the Illuminati, and then between there is chaos that everything comes out of chaos and when you die you go back to chaos there is no afterlife there is no reality beyond that this is it everyone melts back into chaos you have positive negative positive energy and negative energy everyone talk about everyone talk about crystal and positive energy and negative energy this is what they're talking about right you see the gurus Oh, we're going to help you feel better. We're going to align your chakras. What are they talking about? They're talking about positive energy and negative energy. This is there. This is the this is the end point. It is only when you get deeper into Hinduism, when you get into the uh, the original text called the Bhagavad Gita, or also known as the Gita, Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, Bhagavad 
Gita. And they, they shorten it just down to Gita. When you read that text there, you'll understand that the the chaos understanding is only there for, the, for those about re, who are involved in reincarnation. The reincarnation are the average, the average mass. They're the average people, including the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, vassal state. For those who are higher up, who have gone down the right hand path or the positive path, for certain people who meet, reach it, they reach the dharmic stage, they go to heaven. Those who are in the negative state go to hell. They talk about they, they, this. Is openly talked about. And so what happens? Most people are actually taught about the middle part, the uh, uh, the karma, the karmic existence, the physical existence, because they feel it's too difficult for most people to do dharma, and they don't want to keep people. They don't want to have people go see too much about the negative path, the path of darkness. Which ultimately, if you follow the karmic path, you will end up on the left-hand path. You will end up in darkness. Yeah, not explained. It's hidden, but it's there in your yoga classes. It's there with your vegans. Uh, all these things, like Coachella, all this. Look at your Disney shows, right? Owl House, that's the god Moloch. Uh, is there in terms of amphibia? They're amphibia. Your 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 multiverse. You're going through your different dimensions. You, they, they have that existence of the different dimensions. This is where the metaverse comes from. The metaverse that Facebook is talking about and has been done with Google and so on and so forth is a virtual metaverse. It's not a real metaverse. It's a virtual metaverse. In other words, it's a hallucination. It's a computer generated hallucination, but it's a hallucination nonetheless. What is also on the left hand path? The environmental movement. And the environmental movement is on the left-hand path because it's concerned with the physical environment, not the spiritual environment. And that doesn't mean that a person who's on the spiritual environment, on the spiritual path, is neglecting the environment. Quite the contrary, because the the the, the right-hand path is about selflessness, being not being selfish. And I think that's one of the things you can say about the vegans, who are more often than not the vegans are. Not there necessarily for religious purposes, but they're there because they can afford not to eat meat. They can afford to be vegans. A person who is starving, a person who is poor, cannot afford the choice of vegan. It's too expensive. You're, 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 you're barely putting enough uh, food on your table to begin with. They say, oh, now you have to pay a little extra to get the vegan stuff. Sorry, don't have the money. I mean, I know I, I understand this because I'm living on a very tight budget. I've got forty-five dollars a week to spend. No more than I don't have anything more than forty-five dollars. You know, I watch people people go to these vegan restaurants, and they're plopping down thirty dollars plus for a meal. I could never afford to do that. And I know a lot of people who I know people who are living on disability or living in welfare. I know a large chunk of my uncles. And aunts who didn't become wealthy but lived a good life are now living on a fixed income as 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 retired people. They can't afford to go out and be vegan. And so what happens is that you see with the vegans and the sort of the called the, the eco movement is selfish. And you see that the, the, when they attack these freighters that they, that do these to do the fishing. They're not going after Highliner or any of the major commercial fishing fishing boats. They're going after the Chinese. They're going after the Asian boats. And they're sinking them. This has nothing to do with saving the fish or the fish population. This has to do with racism. Right? And now they say racism, oh, racism doesn't exist. It exists for the people who believe exists exists. And what happens when one race it becomes targeted say, Oh, they're a bad group of people. Oh, well, you just see what the Chinese are going to do to us. You teach that enough, you now have a group of people who go out and attack Chinese simply because they believe the Chinese are going to hurt us. That's the systematic racism. But again, it's not real. It's a work. It's a creation. It's a created reality that can be debunked. If we're talking about bringing in more peace than a large chunk of the hate that, that's out there, Say, oh, we got to combat hate. Fine. 
You combat hate not with physical fists, not by beating people up, not by hitting them with skateboards, but you do this by dispelling the myth, going into what the created reality is and breaking it apart, showing what the real reality is, showing how the created reality works, how it pushes people into violence. So the anti you know, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, you want to be anti-establishment? Fine, good, good, go ahead, do that. But understand that your violence is giving the state, the establishment, the, the vassal state, the hirelings, the argument they need to bring in more enforcement. In other words, you're giving them the reason to create the police state. This is, what happened, uh, this is what's happening in Australia. Why is the police state there? Because the people, the riots, gave them the argument to do this. Anyways, uh, I'm going to leave this here. There's not going to be a no cease vlog tonight. Uh, there's just too much to do. There's too much on my plate. And so I'm going to leave this here, and uh, I will see you tomorrow night for once again for a uh, observation vlog, and then afterwards the Gnosis vlog. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life.